Uh, Wendy has been a scientist at the Great Lakes Science Center for 20 years now, um, which is really hard to believe. Uh, she has a bachelor's degree and a master's degree from Guelph University, a PhD from McMaster University, and went ahead and got that education wasn't enough, went ahead and got a second master's degree at Randy's University. Um, so as a, as a Canadian citizen, given her education, she has been a contractor at USGS during her 20 year career. Right now she is currently an employee at Michigan State University. Uh, but I just wanna take the time to acknowledge the many um, achievements Wendy has had in her 20 year career at the Great Lakes Science Center. Um, today she'll be speaking about the, uh, her work on corregonine restoration. And many of you know her uh, through her work and uh, her service and just, you know, when you reach out and say, hey, I'd like some help with identifying this species and they're very these corregonines are very difficult. She's provided great service in doing that. Um, and many of you have collaborated with her on papers and research and, and grants. So I think that work speaks for herself or speaks for itself. Um, she also uh, has, has done some really groundbreaking work, I think at the Science Center in taking advantage of our uh, renovated wet lab. So uh, Wendy was one of the first uh, scientists to come in and, and take advantage of our new facility in Ann Arbor and to look at how things like temperature and flow affect not just the genetics, uh, but also sort of the phenotype of, of, of these corregonine animals. So uh, just a lot of credit to what Wendy's been able to balance in terms of managing our uh, genetics lab and bringing it up to date in terms of its genomic capabilities. Also a lot of uh, important work in the wet lab. Um, and the corregonine part is just a part of her profile. She also has done a lot of great genetics work on brook trout and lake trout that uh, many of you throughout the Great Lakes Basin are aware of. So this is a, a chance to, um, uh, for Wendy to give an update on her recent work on using genetics in support of corregonine restoration and management in the Great Lakes. Um, and hopefully her talk will generate some questions and we can have some discussion at the end. Uh, I don't, I think it's well, many people know now that Wendy is leaving the Great Lakes Science Center at the end of October um, and is currently looking for a new position and uh, has some leads on that. Uh, the emphasis, I think, is that she is not retiring, um, uh, but looking for new opportunities and challenges after a great, uh, in my view, a great 20 year career at the Great Lakes Science Center. So um, with that, Wendy, I will pass the mic or I will not pass the mic, but I will mute myself. And uh, thanks again for giving the presentation this month. Okay, thanks very much for that introduction, Bo. Um, so I'm gonna betray my cultural heritage, which Bo has mentioned by apologizing at the start because my fall allergies chose today to kick in. So my voice is a little squeaky and may cut out. So hopefully, uh, won't happen too much. <clears throat> so uh, just thanks again and good afternoon to everybody for this opportunity to talk about um, several projects that have uh, have been in support of the, the Caribbean restoration, um, you know, efforts that have been going on in the Great Lakes. Um, so I just want to check, is my, did I do that screen share correctly the second time, Nick? Yes, it looks great. All right, super. Yeah. So, and I think just about everybody on the line today kind of knows the backstory here that in the Great Lakes, Caribbeans play a really important role in trophic transfer of energy. And we're once the basis of some very, very large and, and lucrative fisheries, um, Great Lakes wide, and, and still today do support some large fisheries. Um, there are at least eight described forms of Cisco as well as lake and around whitefish in the Great Lakes. Um, and then on top of that, um, there is and was um, ecomorphotypic variation below the species level in Cisco. So just, you know, the, the picture that everybody is familiar with of the large halls of Kriganese. And this is where we are now. You know, some lakes, there's been complete or almost complete extirpation of some or all of the Cisco's and a reduction in abundance in others. So 
with recent ecosystem changes like the decline of invasive alewife and smelt um, and increasing lake trout prop reproduction, a few years ago, management agencies felt like there was an opportunity here for careening restoration and or maybe a reevaluation of management priorities um, with the idea that a restored careening community will improve overall ecosystem health, improve opportunities for developing new fisheries and support lake trout restoration. So there were a series of meetings a few years ago and many discussions among Great Lakes management agencies. And as a result, an adaptive management framework was, was developed. And I think many of you are, are familiar with the wheel of Cisco restoration. So the project I'm gonna talk about today actually supports work in two areas. First, the main area that you know, I, I've been involved in is trying to understand and resolve creating taxonomy um, using genetics and ecology. And second, I'm going to talk a little bit at the end about how some of the tools we've used to address this first question can be used to um, describe and map um, populations and habitat use of Kriganes. Excuse me. So genetics or genomics have a prominent role in both these areas. And the challenge is, is and was to develop a coordinated approach to understand taxonomy develop additional genetic tools for management and understand the role of genetics and environment for protecting or restoring creating, the creating community in the Great Lakes. <clears throat> so then another thing that came out of these meetings where the, the management plan was, was developed was that we needed to look, at, we needed more than with any other species, I think, we need to be able to look at creating diversity in an integrated way. And this means that we meant that we needed to find ways to combine the studies of genetics, morphology, and ecology um, of this notoriously plastic group. So this was going to require not only looking at how diversity was distributed across the landscape, but also a look at how it gets that way. So just you know, going beyond what you've seen in the past genetic studies, where you just get you know you get a description of where the population structure is. We also needed to understand the sort of the why and the how more effectively for this group. So this was a framework that I proposed at one of the workshops that that I said I was going to use to guide my research portfolio in this this area. So this is sort of the, the goalpost I'm going to use to as I walk through um, the rest of this presentation. <clears throat> so what about taxonomy really needs to be resolved? So the relationships between different taxa or forms within the Cisco species complex have been notoriously difficult to figure out not just in North America, but worldwide. And I think they're even gonna to continue to be a challenge even with the use of genomics. Um, so on this graph just shows you a, a really short summary of a lot of past work using mitochondrial microsatellite DNA that suggested that there was a single taxa that should be recognized in North America and that the wide variation in phenotype and habitat use across the range represents ecomorphotypic variation. So uh, these studies were you know, a, a range, a summary of, you know, range-wide data that were collected across a broad geographic scale. Now, however, to meet the needs of the, the wheel of Cisco management, um, we needed to take a closer look at the variation found in the Great Lakes, and most importantly, describe the remaining variation. So when you look at how the Great Lakes were represented in, in these range-wide studies, um, you could find sort of that if for some cases, we couldn't really adequately address the within lake variation. Um, which made sense because, again, this was a range-wide study. Um, and that also not all, not all taxa or forms were analyzed. So therefore, if we're going to evaluate taxonomy in, in the Great Lakes and understand the extant diversity, what we needed to do was put a few more pins in this map and make sure our sampling design reflected the current distribution of creating taxonomy. Um, but before I'm going to talk about sort of the geographic maps of population structure that you guys might be more familiar with, um, one of the first things I did was actually make another kind of map um, that would help us understand eventually the genetic basis of the Kriganin phenotype. Um, namely, we developed a high density linkage map. Um, this was the first for Kriganins by using families of Cisco made with the help of the Fish and Wildlife Service and that were reared at the center. So this, this work was done by uh, Daniel Bloomstein, who was a master's student in Wes Larson's lab using some GLRI funding I got back in you know, 2015. And you can see Danny here with her experimental organism. And, um, and now this, this work is, is now being continued in Trevor Cravenhaus lab um, by Nate Backenstos, who's shown here not holding his experimental organism. And this is gonna eventually produce a full genome map for Cisco. So Nate's using the linkage map that Danny developed as a scaffold or, or an outline 
and is filling in the details of the genome based on DNA from a female Cisco and some gynogenetic Cisco that were created from the research stock that, that were maintained at the center that, that Bo sort of mentioned in his introduction. <clears throat> so now I'm gonna, gonna start talking a little bit now about population structure and the differences among the taxa that we, we sampled in the Great Lakes. So to do this, we developed, first thing we did, and you know, this sort of is still ongoing in some respects, is we've been developing a collection of samples. And this is just, not, the idea here was not just to get tissue samples, but as much as possible, collect something along with those tissue samples, like morphology or stable isotope data, so that we could use in a combined analysis. So on this map shows, you know, at the time I developed this talk, um, each point is a, is a sampling, sampling site and the different taxa are in different colors. So um, it's really important to note here that almost all of these were collected via collaborations with state, provincial, federal, and tribal agencies on both sides of the border and, and kind of represent sort of, you know, how, how sort of collaborative research, you know, works in the, in the Great Lakes and, and, and I think is an example of, you know, when it works successfully, what, what we can accomplish. Um, currently, we have about 7,000 samples, and about three quarters of these can be um, associated with some other type of data, uh, most often morphometrics data. So what I did uh, initially was using a, a similar suite of microsatellite DNA loci across all the taxa that I, I, I looked at and showed you in the previous map. Um, we took a look at population structure. So in this first map, I'm going to show you the results of an analysis of population structure of Cisco. Um, I also looked at Lake Whitefish and Bloater. So on all these maps I'm going to show you, the sample sites are coded in the same color, represent sites that belong to the same genetic population. So for example, you can see in Lake Superior, pretty much everything is, is in the same color, denoting that there was a little population structure. And in contrast to, into that, you can see more within Lake diversity than previously reported, and very notable significant structure in Northern Lake Huron. Um, and this is an area that also holds um, significant phenotypic diversity among Cisco. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about how genetic data can be combined with morphological data to examine functional differences among forms or taxa. So let's compare that map I just showed you to a map of Lake Whitefish population structure from a project I did a few years back. And um, I, I wanted to provide a, as complete a picture possible of the Great Lakes, so I added a summary of data for Lake Ontario from Andrea Bernard's master's work in Chris Wilson's lab. And some of the Lake Michigan data is a summary of Justin Van de Hay's work when he was a graduate student in Brian Sloss's lab at the, the co-op unit at Stevens Point. So as with Cisco, who have similar reproductive behavior and spawning period to Lake Whitefish, we see little, little structure in Lake Superior, Ontario, but significant structure again in Lake, in Lake Huron. Now, because these samples came from spawning collections and both taxa frequently use the same sites at different times of the year, and because we used a similar suite of markers, comparison of these maps can give managers of an idea of what a portfolio of genetic diversity in a restored system of Cisco might look like in Lake Huron and possibly Lake Huron, Lake Michigan, where we have, you know, still um, extant um, Lake Whitefish in, in both those lakes. So finally, I'm going to contrast the previous two species I talked about um, to a deep water Cisco or bloater, um, where most of the differences occur between the lakes. You can see there's little structure within a lake, and most of the differences occur between the lakes. So bloaters spawn in open waters, often over great depths, which again contrasts somewhat with Lake Whitefish and Cisco, who are most often found in shallower waters over rocky habitat. So that, that does vary a little bit from lake to lake. So this, the lack of structure in this, in this group may be related to spawning behavior. Lake Whitefish and Cisco display homing to spawning grounds, while the, the bloaters spawn over open water in sites that change a little bit each year. Also, their larvae may be subject to more mixing by currents because the eggs are not deposited in shallow protected habitats as Lake Whitefish and Cisco do in, in some areas, most, most notably Lake Huron and some parts of Lake Michigan and, and Eastern Lake Ontario. <clears throat> so among the forms of taxa, we see differences in the amount of population structure in lakes where more than one form is, is still found. So another way to look at how genetic variation is partitioned is to look at how well the microsatellite DNA loci distinguish among the forms among lakes. So to do this, what I, what I did was I used 10 microsatellite loci that could be amplified in all the taxa 
and did basically a cross validation test. And this is the only table of numbers I'm gonna show you in the whole talk and you don't really even need to be able to read them. So when you do a genetic species identification, the genotype from an unidentified fish is then compared to composite genotypes from a set of reference samples. And for this test, I basically took each sample out of the reference set, treated it as an unknown and tested to see if I could identify it correctly. So then the number that you get correct and how the misassignments occur can tell you something about how genetic variation is partitioned. So in this chart I'm gonna walk through now, each row shows where each species and is from, is collected from, the lake it's from, and the columns show where they were assigned. So I included whitefish in here because it, you know, it shows you an example of a taxa where you know, people are pretty, pretty certain that you know, there's pretty good agreement on what a whitefish is. So I've included it in this table to show you, to, to sort of give you a contrast among the, the between that and the ciscos. So with whitefish, you can see they can be identified accurately. And when fish are misassigned, it occurs almost always among whitefish from other lakes and not other taxa. Excuse me. So the overall accuracy assignment for lake whitefish is shown on the top here at, at almost 100%. So a similar pattern is seen among, among the Cisco, the, the, accuracy self, the accuracy goes down a little bit, but again, you see that most of the misassignments occur among lakes, and then most of them, when there's a misassignment to another taxa, it's between Cisco and bloater. So now as we move into the deep water Cisco's, things begin to break down a little bit. So among the, the bloater, for example, misassignments to other taxa, especially short jaw Cisco, are almost as common as misassignments among lakes. So Lake Superior is the only lake with remaining deep water forms and distinguishing among them is the most difficult. So, but it is interesting to note that when you run this analysis, excluding the samples from Lake Superior, our ability to distinguish among Lake Whitefish, Cisco and Bloater rises to about 97%. But still our ability to deal with those deep water Cisco's needs further investigation. And this is where the power of genomics came into play. So this is a short, really short primer on, on, on the marker set, the marker type I'm gonna talk about when I talk about the genomics, um, is just to make this comparison, is like markers like microsatellites can be thought of this, this map of trawl locations in Lake Huron. And there's not many places you can actually go and drag a trawl in the lake without destroying it. So you don't really get good coverage of the whole lake and your sample size is small. So the same with microsatellites, you aren't sampling a lot of the genome and there's some places that don't get sampled at all. But in contrast, say if you use acoustics, you can go a lot more places and you can collect a lot more data. So genome scanning methods that produce markers called single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs do some of the same things. Um, in addition, because this is a, a sequence difference that you're looking at and not a size converted into a leo call, sharing data among labs becomes a whole lot easier. <clears throat> So as an example of how genomic methods can improve our ability to study diversity among Cisco's and tell them apart. So here's a plot showing the genotypes of Cisco's from across the Great Lakes using 18 microsatellite DNA loci. So each vertical bar in the plot shows an individual's genotype partitioned across four groups, which was, which was the most likely number of taxa that I came across when I ran the analysis. So as before, while we could distinguish Cisco from the deep water Cisco's, we couldn't do a very, it was really difficult to tell among all the deep water Cisco's with, with great accuracy. And then you contrast this to the bottom slide where we looked at the same fish genotyped using around 1200 SNPs. Um, this greatly improved our, our ability to distinguish among the species. <clears throat> so now that we knew in a small sample of fish collected Great Lakes wide, um, that using gen genomic methods improved our ability to distinguish among deep water Cisco's, we could increase our sample sizes. So this slide summarizes a project that was funded in part by a grant to, to Wes Larson at the co-op unit and by GLRI funding and was, uh, was worked on by um, then postdoc, now Great Lakes Science Center biologist um, Amanda Akis. Um, what she did was she focused on a set of fish from Western Lake Superior and this removed any of the variation due to population structure from the analysis and really let us focus on finding species specific SNPs. So here again, um, in the, on the PCA plot on, on your left, individual fish are represented by dots on this PCA plot. And what you can see here again is that Cisco are most easily separated from the deep water Cisco's. Then there's a dis mostly distinct group of bloater in the lower right hand side of this graph. And then a third group consisting of Kayai and short jaw Cisco. So this, this bar plot showing the genetic composition of each individual says something similar. 
When the number of taxes is set to two, there's a good separation between Cisco and Deepwater Cisco's. And when it's set to three, you can distinguish among Cisco, Bloater, and Kayai. And what you can also see is the presence of some fish that might have been misidentified in the field, as you can see in the, the PCA plot, and possibly others that, that may be hybrids between um, various species. So using the SNPs, we then circled back to update some of our maps of diversity to provide more confident estimates of fine scale population structure. So here's the same sites in Cisco that I showed you from one of my earlier slides. And what we are seeing here among the sites and lakes is more structure among sites and lake superior than was observed with the microsatellites. And also we've improved our confidence in our ability to tell fish from the different populations apart in Lake Huron. So I'm, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit now, but first let's check in on my list of questions and resources. So we've refined our understanding of population structure and improved our ability to distinguish between um, Cisco and at least some of the deep water Cisco's. And we now have more data suggesting that Cisco and possibly bloater may exist as separate taxa in the Great Lakes. And there's population structure observed for Cisco and Lake Whitefish, especially in Lake Huron. Then we developed a set of genomic markers to provide more information about diversity of Cisco's and created one of the densest linkage maps available for creatinine. So with these genomic tools, we can start to, to move along now and look at phenotype genotype interactions or this, this final box in the lower left hand corner, the how and the why. So as, as I've mentioned before, and, and I think everybody, almost everybody on this, on this uh, webinar kind of know, knows, um, firsthand, Cisco's differ in many ways, including body shape, the number of gill rakers, their habitat use, um, you know, depth preferences, and there's also differences in life, life history among them. So the question then is, the million dollar question remains, how do we understand the differences among Cisco's um, using our map and our, and our genomic data? So for, for this, this first analysis I'm going to talk about, we restricted our data set to Lake Superior um, because it has all the remaining taxa and as, a, as I hopefully have demonstrated to you before, minimal population structure. So this map shows the sampling locations of the fish um, from Lake Superior included in the analysis. So as I mentioned at the start, our genetic collections were as much as possible paired with um, collections of other types of data, um, morphological data in this case. So most, most of the data I'm going to show you now was collected in collaboration with Daniel and Mike Sider at the Great Lakes Science Center and the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, uh, respectively. And so because full body morphology is most often associated with variation in like history across taxa, it's a good place to start to understand how differences evolve and how they're maintained. So morphological variation is a combination of genetics, environments, and genotype environmental interactions. And understanding this source of variation, you know, of course, can have implications for management and conservation. And combining the genetic and morphological data will add more power to the analysis because it will allow you to directly examine, examine associations between the genetic data and possibly environmental variables. So instead of looking at, at genetic or morphometric differences um, among the Cisco separately, you look for associations in genetics and between differences in genetics and between differences in and, and differences in morphology. <clears throat> so before I'm going to show you the results of a combined analysis, um, here's what the morphological data look like. Each, each uh, point is a fish and then they're colored by the taxa that they were identified as in the field. So the first two principal components account for about half of the observed morphological va variation. There's some overlap between Kaya and Bloater, while Cisco and Short Jaw Cisco were well separated. Um, so what we did next was we looked for associations between the differences in body shape and genetic markers with high levels of differentiation among the, the samples and the taxa that we looked at. Then we looked at what gene functions might be associated with the markers. <clears throat> we found that markers, markers associated with lipid metabolism were most often represented. And this has been observed in other creatinine, so it wasn't, it wasn't tremendously, it wasn't a big surprise to us. So for example, genes involved in energy production and muscular activity were differentially expressed in dwarf and normal forms of lake whitefish, um, and those could be related to different levels of activity uh, between the two forms. 
So Great Lake Cisco's all perform some kind of vertical migrations, but some, say Kayai, are more extreme than others. Um, as you probably, most of you know, Kayai occupy the greatest depths of all the deep water Cisco's, usually being found in greater than 80 meters of water, and probably make the most effort in their migrations. So our, our result may also be associated with a difference in, in the activity. <clears throat> All right. So these interactions can be studied by looking across the entire genome, which can identify regulatory variants or maybe different gene sequences. So, however, an association from a, a SNP or single nucleotide polymorphism cannot always be tied to a gene. Um, so another way to sort of go about looking at this is to use the variation in the transcriptome or the sequences of expressed genes. And this is what Dan, you and I did in collaboration with some researchers at Wayne State University and University of Buffalo. Um, these results are from the same set of morphological measures um, that, I, that we used for the genomic data. And again, there are also strong associations with genetics related to lipid metabolism. But in contrast to the, the analysis we did just using the genomic data, Moises um, Bernal, who, the postdoc who did most of this work, found that the chi were most distinct. And in addition to associations with lipid metabolism, there were also strong associations with genes related to vision. So this could be related to differences in sample size and possibly the sources of the samples. Most of our short jaw Cisco and chi came from Northern Lake Superior, while those were, theirs were from Western Lake Superior. And while there's little population structuring in the lake, fish from different areas may experience different environments early in life history. So on the other hand, the differences that we're seeing could be due to differences related to the eyes and vision that might be related to the differential use of depth. And it might've been something that was only picked up by scanning the transcriptome. So again, differentiation among genes related to vision has been noted in other studies. So for example, um, Julie Jukins found that differences in gene expression related in, in obsin genes associated with different wavelengths in European Cisco's um, that occupy different um, benthic and mimetic habitats. And Catherine Eaton also found species-specific differences in the coding sequence of rhodopsin in Great Lakes Cisco's, which could be associated with the adaptation of Kayai, again, to the depths of Lake Superior. Now, it start, probably starting to seem like I'm starting to repeat myself again with all these examples and comparisons, but this is pretty significant to see. Um, with complex traits like these, it is important to have parallel results using different approaches. And it would be interesting, it's going to be interesting to see if these trends um, remain and are consistent as more samples and data are added. Okay, so now for the last part of this talk, I'm going to move away from population structure um, and just sort of jump back to the wheel of restoration and kind of showed you how um, this project, these projects have filled in some gaps in our knowledge. Um, with the larger data set and the mul multiple mar marker types, I hope I've shown you that Caribbean diversity is driven by more than just geography and that we may actually have more than two Corridonus taxa in the system. So future work, however, is needed on the deep water Cisco's. Um, specifically, um, how has hybridization impacted the stat status of taxa or forms in the deep water Cisco's? And more analysis of morphology and genetics are needed, for example, among the Cisco ecomorphotypes in Lake Huron. And I know Amanda has, has started to dig into some of these questions with her research. So I'm going to end the talk with a couple of slides just showing you how we've used these, used these resources to start addressing issues in the second box of the wheel. So ideally, I'd be showing you data collected with our new SNP panel, but like many things, COVID has delayed this work. Um, but because some of this work occurred outside of Lake Superior, our old-fashioned microsatellites work just fine because, as you'll recall from earlier, when we tested the accuracy of the markers for um, species identification for lake whitefish, cisco, and bloater using samples outside of Lake Superior, we could distinguish among taxa with high accuracy. So survival during early life history determines levels of recruitment that determine year, year class and strength of fish. And as you all well know, survival depends not only on you know, having the right habitat, but having it at the right time. Um, so there's not a lot of information about habitat use by different creating taxa early in their life that's related in the difficulty to telling them apart. But with these genetic species identification tools, we can collect larval fish and juvenile, juvenile creatinines from different habitats at different times of the year and start to fill in these gaps. So this map shows you where we had, we had samples collected to start looking at this in Lake Michigan and Huron. 
and the sample size we used for each lake. Um, the samples of larval and juvenile crinines were collected from, from both lakes. Um, and the, the agencies that help with these collections um, are listed there. So, you know, big shout out to the um, Lake Michigan from the, the, the researchers and, and members of the Little Traverse Band, um, Kevin Donner and Jason Smith for, for providing all these samples, and the, the folks from the Science Center and Fish and Wildlife Service, the Alpena office, provided a lot of these Lake Huron samples. Um, and then the dots are color coded by the regions of the lakes that, that I'm going to use to summarize the data. So because these data come from a variety of surveys and gears, um, they're summarized by the number of fish and not by effort. Um, so those are just the names of the regions that I'm going to use in the next couple of graphs. So here's a summary of each species caught in different regions of the lake. So while bloater are most common in all areas of Lake Huron, the most commonly observed species varied in different parts of Lake Michigan. It was Lake Whitefish in the north, bloater in the south, and Arda and Cisco in Grand Traverse Bay. So this may relate to differences in the gear and the sampling effort, but possibly also differences in habitat. So next, I summarize the catches by species and month of capture. So the, the, the x-axis is the month, the, the, the numerical month, and then the y-axis is the number, and then the bars are color-coded by the, the taxa. <clears throat> so in the main basin, um, on, on the lower graph where the catches are more diverse, we see more lake whitefish in Cisco in the earlier months and bloater later in June and July. And this makes some sense when you think about the spawning period of each taxa, lake whitefish followed by Cisco and then bloater. So for Lake Michigan, I combined all the samples from the main basin and I didn't, excuse me, I didn't include um, Green Bay because we don't have samples from spring and summer. Grand Traverse Bay on the top graph um, where Cisco were captured most, most often, um, and they appeared most often in April. In the main basin of Lake Michigan, Lake Whitefish and Cisco are observed in April and May, while Bloater are observed, are observed more often starting in July and August. So this is similar to Taylor Brown's work on Lake Ontario, where Cisco and Lake Whitefish were most common in April and May, but we don't see the dominance of Cisco that she did. <clears throat> So the Lake Michigan main basin is the only place where we had onshore and offshore collections to, to compare those two habitats. All three species were found in both habitats with bloater and Lake Whitefish more common offshore, while the differences in Cisco catches were not significant between the two habitats. This is different what, to what Jim McKenna observed in a recent analysis of Karinians caught in Chamon Bay during a similar time of year and also using genetics to identify larvae. He found that Cisco were more common in the offshore habitats and Lake Whitefish onshore. Bloater are no longer found in Lake Ontario. So this difference could be related to the habitat sampled and the way they are defined. So namely, Jim and his crew sampled a bay where onshore was defined as less than 1.5 meters in depth, while our samples in Lake Michigan came from a coastal region where the onshore was defined as less than 18 meters in depth, so quite a big difference. So collecting more samples from embayments in Lake Michigan and even Lake Huron are needed to make a comparison to Lake Ontario data set and to get a sort of a great, a sense Great Lakes wide of, you know, how these embayments are used in different lakes. <clears throat> so to summarize, um, we found that the spatial distribution of Cisco, Bloater, and Lake Whitefish depended on where you surveyed. Bloater are most common throughout Lake Huron, while we observe differences in the distribution of the three species in Lake Michigan among the north and south basins and the bays. And again, this could have been also due to the differences in sort of the, the gears and the, the different surveys that were used. Um, bloater and Lake Whitefish were observed more often offshore in the main basin of Lake Michigan, but we needed more targeted sampling in bays and to increase the sample size from Lake Huron to better assess the differences in the uses of onshore and offshore habitat. And we found that Cisco and Lake Whitefish are more common early in the spring and bloater later on. And all taxa are present in the habitats, but at different times, possibly when the temperatures and the zooplankton community are, are different. So as we go forward, adding more data about the habitat used by the different species will help us better understand these, these basic life history needs. Okay. So just my final slide. Um, so just sort of where we are and what I, I think might could be next. Um, so with this comprehensive collection of, of corrigonines that you know couldn't have been, I don't think could have been generated with all the great partnerships and all the partners I've worked with over the years, 
Um, we've refined our, you know, started to refine our knowledge about taxonomy and improved our understanding about how morphology is related to differences in habitat use and further to our, our started to further our understanding of early life history and habitat use. And with that, I'll stop and answer any questions. <laughs> Thanks very much, Wendy. Your voice definitely held up throughout that, despite your allergies. <laughs> so uh, definitely a round of applause. I don't know, virtual round of applause. <laughs> in this strange world we live in. There you go, Trevor's getting it done. Uh, so this is a time these uh, webinars have been really effective at generating discussion and questions. Uh, we definitely have time, um, uh, at least uh, I think Wendy has some time uh, up until 1.30 or so, uh, so long as the conversation goes. Um, so you can submit those in the chat um, or you can just hand and uh, if you're comfortable, turn on your camera and uh, we can do it that way. Um, while people are thinking about that, I, I just want to, I really like, Wendy, what you, what you, how you set it up in terms of um, the, the genetic structure for Lake Whitefish and, and how that could be used sort of as a marker for Cisco, given similarities in early life history, where they spawn, when they spawn. Um, and and it just struck me, you're finding a lot of genetic structure for Cisco in Lake Huron, but none for bloater, as you indicated. Um, but then when I saw the bloater map for Lake Michigan, it did look like there was some different colors there. And that was kind of surprising to me. So I wondered if you just thought at all about sort of the differences in bloater patterns between those lakes, um, or if those samples are even collected during spawning period and or, or not, maybe they're collected during the fall surveys. Yeah, and this, the, you kind of hit on what I think might be impacting some of those results that those samples are a mixture of actual spawning fish. So they're, you know, we, we've been lucky enough to, to work on this when they're starting to collect for the hatchery development. And, you know, we were able to do some genetics on, on the fish that were sampled then. Um, and which tend to be around in the same places. And then you contrast that to fish that were collected um, during fall spawning surveys from the Science Center. Those are the main two sources of the samples. And that difference in when things were collected may be part of it um, that, that may account for some of the, some of the, the differences that you're seeing. But there, there still is, uh, there still appears to be some you know, pretty subtle population structure in, in the lake as well. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. And it's different than I remember uh, that Julie's Turgeon's work, where she didn't really find much difference between Michigan and Huron with respect to bloater. So, okay. Any other questions? Are there any questions for Wendy? Randy has a question. I can't find the hand raised, but uh, you don't need it. Go for it. I was wondering if you're uh, it uh, from what I saw that uh, you're increasingly uh, lining up with uh, Julie Turgeon's 2003 paper on reticulate evolution. That uh, it looks like this is supporting it with these uh, uh, these differences in in lakes between the forms. Uh, oh, I, not sure. uh, yeah, well, we are seeing, you know, similar to what she saw, we are seeing differences among lakes and also, you know, beyond that, but we're also seeing that the diversity is based on taxonomy and geography so that the differences, so that the forms, you know, are the species are, sorry, <coughs> that, you know, bloater are still bloater regardless of the lake that they're coming from, but there are differences among the lakes. And then Cisco are still Cisco. You can tell the, you know, the, the Cisco from Lake Superior, the Cisco from Lake Huron from the bloater from Lake Huron, but then there's also additional structure within the lake. So I think we are seeing some of the same things she was sawing, but I, I also kind of want to 
not entirely that we are seeing are also seeing species specific differences or tax specific differences more more than what you saw to some extent, especially outside of Lake Superior. So well, if I could reply, then I, I'm kind of wondering, uh, you're finding differences between what you're calling species, but that doesn't mean that th those uh, those differences are, are phylogenetic. And there's two explanations for that, and you're using one of them. And yeah, that that's that's entirely true. The, the more classical phylogenetic analysis does need to be redone. Um, one thing that I just haven't been able to do is we've been trying to reduce some of the mitochondrial work that, that she did using the same markers and increase our sample sizes. And then definitely that, that kind of analysis does need to be done as well. So I'm just, as I was talking to you, I was reading Chris's, so Chris Wilson put a question in the chat. He always has such good questions. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but does that answer your question, Randy? Well, yeah, that's what, yeah. That, uh, I, I was pleased to hear you say that there's an alternative explanation for, for your results. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, getting, getting more of the, the superior, a few more superior samples will, will really help. And then actually doing the more sort of classic phylogeographic analysis, putting a clock on things is still needed, you know, and you've seen, you know, and that some of that work is going, you know, with Trevor, Trevor uh, Nate, who I mentioned is also doing some of that work with some of the genome, genomic data he's collecting. So the, that all of this is forthcoming. Um, and Chris's question is actually kind of along the same line. So the data looks like the cranings make up more of a phylogenetic shrub than a tree, yes. <laughs> um, Considering the historical losses, which could be considered pruning that have got on, what would you predict for form or species reemergence? And then is like resurgence along the same trajectories or parallel emergence through novel pathways? Um, does the question make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, I think it's going to be, I, my answer would be yes. <laughs> It's, it's an either or, not a yes or no. <laughs> well, I, I think it's really going to depend, you know, the, I think that some of that's going to be lake specific because the lakes are experiencing very different pressures and environments these days than maybe they did when they were originally colonized to some extent. So in some, you may see those same, you know, say, for example, Lake Superior, where, you know, it's the least, what we always say, the least disturbed system, that you may see the sort of the same trajectories and things that, you know, impacted their development before maybe occurring, like differences in habitat use. Um, or, in, you know, in contrast to other lakes, you know, you might, see, you know, like Lake Huron and Lake Ontario, where the, the habitats are very different. And have been impacted by you know invasives, even though they're declining in some lakes, you may see because of those things, you may see them you know emerging through new pathways. Um, you know, we have some interesting discussions. I've had some interesting discussions with Chuck Bronte about this, where you think about sort of historically in Lake Huron, for example, the large populations in Saginaw Bay and the Detroit River probably didn't have a lot of structure and probably what it, were what drove the portfolio of diversity in that lake. Whereas like these small distinct populations that you see in all the embayments and the North Channel probably didn't have as great a, ro a role, but with those big populations gone, now those smaller populations are a bigger player. And in these small discrete populations, evolution proceeds a little bit differently than it does in a large, large mixing population, right? So that's, that's different than it was before. Okay, I guess I was trying to get at for, for the actual forms or species themselves. Yeah. Would, would you basically expect uh, the same genomic differences to drive them? Or could you get to the same phenotypic endpoints by a different path? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think, again, it could be a bit of both. <laughs> 
because <laughs> again, it's going to depend on the system where you have, you have like, again, the same example, you know, if you think about Lake Superior, while well, the forms are still there, you know, we, we've got some evidence of hybridization among them. And it's like, well, if that's going to continue, you may, that you may not see things going along the same trajectory. Um, and then say you contrast that to another lake where some of the forms have disappeared, um, you know, you, you may eventually end up seeing differences in habitat use among corrigonines that, you know, get to that, that same sort of state of differential habitat use, but it, they may look a little bit different than, than what was there historically. Yeah, but fill, fill a similar niche. Yeah. Yeah, they're going to fill the niche, but I don't, I don't, I still don't, I don't think the niche was qu is quite the same as it was because, you know, the environment has changed. Um, I guess one, one quick follow-up with apologies to Bo. Um, so with considering there, there's so much of this sort of shared ancestral diversity, um, if there's ecological opportunity, do you think any of the forms are gone for good? Like, has that part of the shrub been pruned away permanently? Or could you expect sort of a reemergence from, from that basal diversity in response to the ecological opportunity? Yeah, I, I think some sort of diversity, you know, could reemerge, and, and, you know, a new branch could emerge and how similar it'll be to what was there before, I think is going to depend on, you know, what the habitat looks like and what, and what that source is. Cool. Curious to see. Okay, thanks. All right. No apologies at all, Chris. I think this is good conversation and and if I could just kind of go back to Randy, I mean, the alternative hypothesis that could also explain your results or what Wendy showed. Um, could you just share with others that may not be as familiar, including myself, like dispelling that out for everybody, just so that we're all on the same page? Is it hybridization that you're thinking about or? Uh, not exactly. It, the. Uh... The hypothesis would be that uh, every every Cisco contains uh, uh, something of the uh, say the uh, Regardi genotype, and through these uh, series of glaciations, uh, there are, there's been a retention of certain sequences that enable this uh, rapid evolution into these distinct forms, and uh, this might sound uh, crazy. Uh, within the Great Lakes here, but uh, Louis Bernichet has showed this for uh, preserved sequences between European whitefish and uh, lake whitefish across a half a million years or so. So I think uh, because it, it seems unlikely that uh, Kayai colonized Lake Ontario if they were, if there was, uh, if you know, based on a, a phylogenetic hypothesis, from Lake Erie, so that all of these, the four forms that were uh, in uh, Lake Ontario would have had to establish first in Lake Erie. And that's reasonable for say one of the deep water Cisco's and, uh, and uh, the shallow, uh, shallow water Cisco. But it's kind of tough to, uh, to believe that they would have all established in there about the same time and then colonized Lake Ontario. And so the, the reason these things look alike morphologically and look alike as Amanda's found out uh, for the same form uh, is, is what you're looking at is those genes that make a, a regardi a regardi and they're preserved across glaciations. So that's the alternative explanation. And well, and to add, up, add on to that, uh, Chris's comment, I doubt that you're going to, we would see these forms completely reemerge or even halfway reemerge because you'll, the, 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 if there's one deep water Cisco there already, it's going to dominate and make, make uh, uh, speciation difficult. We, we're, we're seeing that. These things look like, uh, uh, except they're following bouts of, of uh, hybridization, that they're canalized genetically. And so, yeah, over very, very long periods of time, you might get speciation and some of these forms uh, 
arising, even though those gene com some of those gene complexes are there, but it's it's going to be difficult for what we see. We see like for instance a bloater uh, in Lake Michigan that you know we don't see much change in it, despite the massive changes in its with, with the with the whole deep water Cisco complex in Lake Michigan. So that I was kind of long winded there. So no, no, that's helpful. It's helpful to, to hear that where you where, where your question was coming from, and I wonder if I mean I'm not I'm falling behind on what the latest genomic techniques are. Uh, we're going from macrosatellites to the GTSeqs, the RAD sequences, but the the latest seems to be a whole genome sequence, and I wonder if the whole genome sequence approach that Wendy sort of indicated that Trevor and others are working on, she's working on, um, is that, could that sort of help us separate out if the result is an artifact of those genes always being present and you're now just picking them up based on what part of the genome you're looking at? I mean, could that help us get at the question that you're seeing thumbs up from Amanda? I don't know if Trevor's still on too, Wendy. Chris, any other geneticists just helping us understand this? Okay. And how far are we from like a whole genome sequence, say, of one of these so called species of, art of RTD? Is it like decade? Is it five years, one year? I think Trevor can speak to that. I know that. Um... Nate's been wrapping up some of his work. Have I got that right, Trevor? Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, the, he's presented early results from that, but uh, still, still trying to piece it together a little bit. But yeah, in a, in a year or two, I think we'll have something to share. Is that with Cisco, Trevor? With Cisco, right. Okay. All right, um, thank you. Since I have my camera on, can I uh, ask? Uh, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, Wendy, I really appreciate that uh, talk, and uh, in particular, just the breadth of, of what you presented is really, really incredible. Um, I was wondering about if you, I know there's maybe no real answer to this question, but if you have any speculation about um, nigripinus, uh, is there is the thought that somewhere out there there's in hiding a, a population of those that's reproducing among themselves in some unknown location? Or uh, are these remnants that are sort of mixing in with other species? And uh, do, you, do you have any speculation or, or maybe someone knows the answer? Um, I, I don't care to speculate until I get a, you know, just the sample sizes are so low that, and, and kind of so scattered across the lake that I, I can't really say at this time. Or, or maybe if I can ask it differently, are, are those spatially, I didn't see on your map exactly where they're from, but do they always show up in a particular location or? Uh... Um, they do tend to be, hey, boy, um, let me pull up, let me do a screen share again real quick. Um, is it like Northeast Lake Superior where the dot was? Yeah, can I? Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. I don't know if anybody from Lake Superior is on the call that can help talk about this diversity. And can you see the map? Have I got the slide of the map up? Okay. Um, if you just point to the, yeah, just point to the Nyagrippinus, that yellow there. there. And there. So more on the northern shore of the lake is where we've got our samples from. Um, which I don't think is at this point representative of their distribution. Thank Trevor, you. Do you, Trevor, in your Lake Superior work, do you have nigripinus in your in your samples? Uh, we do not. That's yeah, part of why I'm curious about it. Yeah, um, the the one sample looks fairly close to to uh, Lake Nipigon. Uh, is my geography right there? Uh, yeah. Could those be occasional washouts or something out of Nipigon or? Um... Yeah, that I doubt. Um, but but that it, it's an area where they are found. 
where they have been found. Yeah, certainly we had Mark Ridgway that talked early on in this webinar talking about the Ontario Inland Lakes uh, with blackfin. Um, and then there also are some in some of the Minnesota lakes. And I don't know if anybody's done a, I mean, in some of the Ridgeway work, they talk about the relatedness of those to the Great Lakes forms. Um, and my recollection is they think they are different, um, at least based on Mark's work, or Mark's work with Julie. Um, do I have that right? Yeah, so um, for whether, to what, whether or not everybody's pulled together all these samples that are suspected negrophinous and uh, identified as negrophinous and superior. Um, I'm not sure. Amanda, can I put you on the spot since I don't know if Owen is on the call today? I know that there is a Lake Superior project. You went, you went using Owen's archive fish. Do you know if any of those are negrophinous that you'll be analyzing with Owen's project? Yes. So we do, we are currently working on this and we have a bunch of um, different forms that have been morphologically identified as things in the lake um, that are considered rare, like negrophinous, um, things that are considered more or less extirpated from the lake, but we have a form that was collected that looks very similar, like Ricardi. Um, and so what we're doing is using the GTC panel, which is about 500 loci, um, to try and differentiate between, um, see if we can differentiate between these things that are morphologically ID'd as one, um, and, but we're not certain if they represent a discrete category. So that was one thing that I don't know if Wendy touched about, but it's not always easy to tell these forms apart morphologically, um, especially things like bloater and kai, um, which are very common in Lake Superior. Um, and so that's a component of trying to untangle some of our results. Um, is to understand, you know, it, and that's the power of if we can get genetic markers that can tell these things apart, um, their value, because then we can determine where these things separate. But I do know we're getting a lot of collections now um, with a, a collaboration between Matt Herbert and Mark Vincent, um, where they're going off of Grand Island and collecting off of Grand Island during the winter in December and sometimes even early January. Um, and that's right below the deepest part of Lake Superior and they get a lot of interesting forms down there and there are a lot of rare things that get collected there. Um, and as far as I'm aware, it's the only sort of dedicated collection in that sort of eastern arm of Lake Superior um, where you're getting consistent collections of things. And so um, it'll be really interesting to see what comes of this. I unfortunately don't have any um, results to share or to pipe in with except that we do have a bunch of short jaw, we do have a bunch of negrepinous samples that have been morphologically ID'd as these by Owen Gorman. Um, and so we're hoping that we can hit them with some of our more powerful genetics tools and also see that difference um, in the genetics as well to back that up. And it will give us a better idea of what's still there in Lake Superior and also a little bit better of an idea about where we're seeing these these fishes. And, and I think it's possible. We've, I have a project with Wendy um, where we've looked at archival scale collections from um, you know, the, the 20th century. And we've looked at extirpated forms and we can tell them apart with this panel. Um, so we're hoping that contemporary forms could also be told apart, but we don't, we don't have the results yet. So it's coming. Yeah, really key, I think, for us to really understand the existing diversity that exists in Lake Superior. I, I would, Randy, I'd mentioned something in regard to these black fins, and that is in the Superior, the black fins that are being caught uncommonly now, the, the ones that were in the uh, monograph, do not look like Kelts' black fins. And we don't know why exactly, but but uh, so that's something to keep in mind if you're taking contemporary black fins and you're comparing them with uh, Kelts's black fins. Maybe they are the same thing, but they don't they don't look alike. The, the big differences in their snout. Kel, uh, yeah. Kelts's 
Kelch's black fins have a blunted nose and these uh, contemporary black fins, which we named uh, Nigripinus unnamed in the monograph have uh, pointed snouts. So it's an interesting problem, but I do think I do think that uh, you could get, uh, Cisco larvae for all of the Ciscos could be coming down from Lake Nipigon. I think that would be that would be that would be expected. I mean, larvae get get entrained and and away they go. So, well, and just to follow that up, Randy, I think that um, Lake Nipigon is very 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 interesting study system for us. Because from what I understand, I have not done any field work in Lake Nipigon. So I haven't seen what these fish look like. But from what I've been told by people who have collected in the Great Lakes and have collected in Lake Nipigon, what's called, you know, Xenithicus in, in Nipigon looks very different than the Xenithicus that they're getting out of Thunder Bay and out of the northern part of Lake Superior. Um, so I think that's, and the blackfin too might be very different as well. And so I think that touches on Chris's point where, you know, these could be cases where you have both shared lineages within the Great Lakes, but ecological, you know, similar ecological divergence in a separate lake um, that's large enough to allow that to happen. Um, and then could serve as a potential source population to fill an ecological niche, not with an ancestral, you know, form, but with something that carries the same, um, the, the, it fills a certain niche within that lake that is similar to something that has gone in the Great Lakes. Um, and so I think it's a really fascinating comparison that we haven't had a chance to really dig into. Um, based on the RAD data, it's a totally different phylogeographic uh, or phylogenetic lineage than Lake Superior. So if there was a lot of transfer from Nipigon to Lake Superior, I think we'd see it in the genetics because it, it's 100% boom different between those, those fishes, between Lake Nipigon and Lake Superior. Um, but I think it's fascinating to dig into, you know, given that these things have been separated for a while, but, you know, could they have just diverged independently um, ecologically, I think that's that's a good point to consider. We just don't have the data yet to figure that out. And I think that's, it's available to us. Unlike situations that you brought up like Kayai in, in Ontario, they don't exist anymore for us to examine that, but we do have a, a similar system um, with a lot of forms present in Lake Nipigon. And so I think that's just kind of a, a really fantastic area where we could dig into looking more into that type of thing. Good discussion. We are at 1.34. Um, and I don't know, Wendy, if you are okay with continuing so long as there are questions. Just wanted to check in on that. We still have like almost 50 people on this webinar, which is really cool. I love yeah. it. Uh, and I think, I don't know what our max was, Nick, but I think we were over 75 at one point. So. Yeah. And, and just on the Lake Nipigon thing, I, I, just thinking on the geography on the area, I think that's also helping maintain those differences you see. Um, you know, because if I, I think if if things were getting entrained, you'd, we'd probably see more similarity among those those northern bays in Nipigon than we do because it's they're like Amanda said they're in a completely different the lineage. It's a completely different night and day lineage. Um, a very clear break break that you you see with just about every marker that has been used on them. Like a great area for study. However, yeah, that, yeah. learning some stuff here. Very cool. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah, and you know they they demonstrate, you know, these fish worldwide demonstrate their ability to move into uninhabited niches and, you know, recreate, you know, recreate the, the you know, the, the f some sort of form in in that in that area. So it's. Yeah, it, it, it'll remains to be seen what will happen as we're moving things into, you know, it's starting to move things into empty areas. Or in some cases, like Lake Michigan, they're starting to move themselves back into the main part of the lake. Yeah, the Lake Michigan Cisco is a great story, just yeah. phenotypically how they're now eating diet items that, you know, based on Ben Breaker and Joey Jonas's work that we <laughs> never really expected them. Not a planktivorous niche, but 
as much as a, a Pisces or as a plankton board. So yeah, fascinating stuff. Yeah, and the whitefish in Lake Huron actually are also a great example of that, where you've got fish from, you know, Thunder Bay versus very close by that, you know, some are eating zebra mussels and others are eating fish and the, the two, they look completely different. You know, one is very deep bodied and, and, and you know, a lot of that could, and, you know, very similar genetically, but, you know, such a different diet that they just look very different. So the, the work that I didn't talk about it, but the work on the hatchery where we, you know, reared the fish at, at um, what, what we did was, um, and I didn't talk about it because it's, I just didn't have time to fit. I didn't know where to fit it in. Um, we did a project um, again in cooperation with Trevor where we brought and, and with, with, you know, Dan and the folks from the Fish and Wildlife Service, where we brought both Superior, the same year class and the same year class, Superior and Huron fish into the lab and subjected them to different flow and temperature regimes and looked at the differences in the growth um, just to see how that impacted their body shape in the first year or so and growth rate. And Trevor is doing some gene expression work on them to see what, you know, what genes are turned off, off and on. Does it different between the two different, you know, superior versus Huron? Um, and just had some preliminary data from the, the undergraduate student who did a lot of the, who really pounded out a really good morphological analysis, um, you know, kind of founding that, finding that, you know, temperature is, you know, as we kind of expected, has a really impact on, big impact on how similar they are to the wild fish. So we had the parents of these fish and compared the shape of wild caught fish to the fish in the hatchery. Um, so that'll be some interesting work because that's, you know, that's, Starting to dig into that whole question a little bit more by changing the changing the environment they're rearing in, being reared in, and looking at. Yeah. So the ones that were reared at colder temperatures, more like we assume they're incubated in the wild, were more like their parents. Is that sort of the preliminary? We're more like the wild fish. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that'll be more interesting work to see, and just um, yeah, just start you know, and also starting to like now that we can sort of we have information on the genetics, we, we're getting better at telling them apart, you know, we're getting, you know, Randy and, and Chris and Jonah and all the folks that have been doing all the morphometrics, you know, in all the various lakes, now they're, they're building these massive data sets where the, the thing that I've been interested in, what I really would be interested in next to see with the morphometrics is, you know, how does that vary from site to site across year class, and then starting to relate that to differences in, you know, was it a, you know, what was the ice coverage that year? How long was the incubation period? What, you know, how long were they in a particular habitat early on in life history? Um, those kind of environmental impacts we know ha can have a great impact on, you know, what they look like and where they go, you know, even potentially what, what they're doing as an adult form. There's, you know, a pretty big literature in other species where what they're, you know, what a fish eats early on in life and your literature in insects, but in fish can have an impact on what they look like as an adult. So that'll be the, the next, that for me, that would have been like the next sort of big thing to, to start to start looking at. Okay. I guess wistful that you're leaving. <laughs> there are a lot of nice comments, Wendy, I don't know if you've had a chance to read the chat. From Tom McDougall, uh, Chris again, Leon Carl, our former lab director, and, uh, and your office mate, Ed Roseman, he won some nine, <laughs> right, nine name o bars. <laughs> That's one big bummer about uh, we used to have a lot of potlucks a couple of times a year, and you could always count on Wendy bringing delicious nine name o bars. What's the right way to? I'm probably butchering that. But how do you say that? The nine o. So yeah, I would have been happy to do another 20 years of stuff, but eh. glad to see the, the program starting to get, to, get, to get good support. So that'll be great going forward. To, I, I think these questions will get dug into. Anybody else want to offer a, a final comment or question? Just come up, um, you can unmute yourself or thanks again for staying you know, well beyond an hour, and, and especially thanks to all those who uh, gave comments and questions. So I, I think I have a question. Um, 
I, I guess sort of like to help, you know, one thing I always think about it is sort of to fill in these gaps, you know, what would be the next, what is the next kind of information gap to fill in where genetics could be useful? So is the, you know, being able to identify larval fish, you know, that, that's probably helpful, but what would be the next, so a question that like biologists out there, what would be the kind of next thing that you need for sort of on the, the more practical management side of things? Like we've had a discussion about sort of the past history and how might that, you know, where did the fish come from? And, and that, that kind of debate, which is, is frankly, is gonna never die down. <laughs> but on the more like, you know, understanding habitat use and, and the more, what I kind of think of as more practical management just from other folks out there, like what is the next next thing that you need from the geneticist to help answer those questions? I know a lot of our deep water science colleagues would love the ability, like an ELISA test or something, not even ELISA, something very simple, of course, when you could I mean, I got to, I don't know if Vic is still uh, with us, but Vic emailed earlier, you know, yesterday with, what is this? You know, when they're less than 100 millimeters, is it a bloater, is it a Cisco? Always challenging. So it's basically the larval fish question up to at least the yearling stage, I think, where these animals are really hard to tell apart. And I can't even imagine what that would be like on Lake Superior with the deep water diversity they have. You know, Owen has done a really nice job of trying to get at that. And for the most part, I think their assignments are proving to be true based on data that you showed with a few potential misassignments and I think command has shown similarly. But that bloater Cisco question for yearlings, if there's a way we could develop like a rapid test, almost like we do for COVID, um, use that on the boat. Wow, that'd be, that'd be kind of a game changer, especially as Cisco become more abundant in Michigan and Huron. But I don't know, that's a good question. Others? want to offer uh, their perspectives? Call anybody out based on who's still here. Okay. I mean, how possible is that, Wendy, to get to sort of like a rapid, I mean, you, you have the marker. Of course, it, it's not rapidly done. It takes a while in the lab. What, what would it take us to get to that point of, of, of having technology that we could deploy on the boat to distinguish, say, Hoya versus RT? I, I have seen, I remember, and Amanda can probably add to this, I remember kind of seeing a talk a couple of years ago at an AFS meeting where somebody was a adapting basically the CRISPR technology in, it was called Sherlock, I think was the acronym, where that's pretty much what it was, where you put the thing in a tube and squished it up and added some chemicals and it was a color-based and it would give you a, a species identification. It, yeah, it was, that, that seemed to have like potential applications. And I know we, we, it's something that we had discussed in the past is like an onboard. And I think that's what it was being marketed as, is, uh, you know, a way to get it was like a chunk of fish or a piece of slime or, or some part of the fish or maybe an egg that they were using for like a rapid ID. Um, so I, I think those, if I'm remembering it correctly, that might be the, the, next, the next tool is to, the next thing where you, yeah, I, I, off the top of my head, I can't envision how it would work, but that, that seems like there was an <laughs> application there. I'll just jump in and, and add a little bit more to what Wendy said. There is, um, there's some folks out on the West Coast um, that have developed the, the um, approach that Wendy was talking about. It's a CRISPR-based approach called Sherlock, and they used it to differentiate different um, spawning populations and tributaries. So I think they used it on, I believe it was smelts, and I think they're also applying it to salmon out there, or different salmon runs as well. Um, and essentially what you need is a binary. So you need something that's fixed in one form and alternative in the other form. Um, and so it's right now, I think uh, Mariah Meek is somebody in Michigan at MSU who has been working with the folks uh, um, doing Sherlock 
um, on salmon in the West Coast. And so I talked a little bit with her about that. And the trick is finding those loci that are fixed. Um, so for example, we have that fixed locus in the opsin gene <laughs> in Kai Ai, um, that is, is either uh, the alternative state or a mixed state in, in other fishes. So we just need to, I think, dig more across the genome, rely more on these genomic resources that are being built up by Trevor's lab and our lab and um, try to find those locations where these things have diverged enough that there's a marker like that, you can tell them apart. But it's um, that's the first step is find the markers. And the next step is to deploy something like that. And right now, I don't know how broad scale it's being used. I think it still takes about 30 minutes to an hour to get that, that ID. But if you're stuck with something confusing on a boat, um, you know, you can get those IDs within a kind of reasonable time on a boat. Um, yeah. But it's still not instantaneous. It's not like a litmus paper where you can go ding. But I think we're going to get there. I think that it's just a matter of a couple years before before you have that, that capability um, in terms of the technology. But in terms of the, the individual resources and being able to use that technology, you have to dig in and find those those loci that will allow you to, to differentiate. Yeah. So that's that's kind of been one of our goals is is to try and dig further across, find those fixed differences and and see if we can at least avail ourselves of the potential of those, because that'd be fantastic, especially on the boats in Superior, if you could just go, ah, yeah, that's definitely a bloater. I was right. <laughs> it may even end up being like a two or three binaries if you can get the time down, because, you know, it might be use a mitochondrial marker to tell whitefish from the Cisco's and then one or two more to tell the Cisco's apart. But that yep. would, you would need the time to get cut down to do it. Yep. Hmm. Very cool. All right. Trevor, I hope you were listening to that too. Yep, I'm here. I'm just taking it in. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, it's uh, 10 till 2. Let's go ahead and call it a wrap. Thanks again to our great presentation by Wendy. Great. Uh, uh, turnout we had again on a Friday and join us again next uh, October 1st with Aaron Dunlop. She had a great presentation on larval like whitefish. Until then, thanks everybody. <laughs>